Today on Under the Big Tree, building a synth DIY kit from the ground up. I've loved building electronics kits for as long as I can remember. When I was a kid, I had this electronics experiment kit from Radio Shack that let you create all sorts of circuits by hooking wires to little springs that were connected to components. From there, it was little radios and other kits for kids that you soldered together. Much later, I began experimenting with building electronic instruments and circuits in grad school. I built a theremin, a rack-mounted series of synth circuits I designed based around a 555 timer chip, and many others. It fired my imagination, and nothing was more satisfying than performing on an electronic instrument you built yourself. Decades have gone by, and I'm still doing it. I went through a long phase of building LA-2A and 1176 compressors, tube and solid-state mic preamps, and Pultec EQs. I laid off for a lot of years, but then, when I got into Eurorack some years back, I instantly jumped back into building synth module kits. Now, I'm working on my Serge system, and the majority of it has been built by me. Why build synth kits? Well, there are a number of reasons. The first is cost. You can get a lot more for your money by doing it yourself. You are effectively trading your hours for dollars. The second is art. As I mentioned, I get a great deal of satisfaction out of performing and recording using instruments I made. Then, there is customizability. Depending upon how far you want to take it, you can change the art or the functionality of your device to suit your needs. And finally, it is really fun and incredibly relaxing. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle or knitting, except you get a cool electronic doohickey at the end of it. So, if you have never built an electronic synth module, but have been intrigued by this DIY approach, then this video is for you. I had a camera by my side while I was building this Euclidean sequencer for my Serge system. I specifically chose a module that has both analog and digital elements, so you can see how to solder resistors as well as upload code to an Arduino. The point is to show that you can do nearly anything that you set your mind to. The video is pretty long and painstaking, and the camera work is not the greatest. But if you want to see how to build, clean, and test one of these kits from the ground up, then come on along and join me. Okay, it is January 2022, and my child and I are currently quarantined due to an outbreak of COVID in our family. So I am trying to take some of that time to make a video that has been on my mind for a while. And this is sort of a beginner's intro to creating DIY synthesizer modules. You can do so much in terms of building up your electronic music system by building some or all of your stuff. It gives you a great deal of satisfaction in terms of knowing that what you've built you're using. Plus, it's significantly less expensive. You're putting some elbow grease in to creating something that is unique and absolutely yours. This video is aimed at people who haven't done this before uh, to get them started and to encourage them. So what I'm going to do first is talk about the different tools of the trade that are necessary, and then we're going to go through and actually build a kit. So let's start with the most important stuff, the things you really can't do this without. These here are the primary tools that I use for DIY electronics, and I've been using them for many years. You try a bunch of different things, and then eventually you find the things that you absolutely use, and then you just go with those over and over again. So let's go over them very briefly. The first one, and by far the most important, is the soldering iron. So in my case, I use a Weller iron here. Don't use one of the simple pen irons. You really want one that has a base and that is designed to be a little bit more professional. They're not terribly expensive. The ones from Weller and Hako are the brands that I know and that I use, and I've been using the same iron for several years now, and it's absolutely great. It allows you to be able to dial up and down the temperature and adjust it to whatever it is that you're working on. Next up, I have a fan right next to the iron to try to suck in some of the solder fumes. This isn't perfect, but 
we're not living in a perfect world, and this hopefully gets some of the solder fumes away from me and into that charcoal container. This is a little bit of a luxury item. It's a PCB holder from Panavice, and it has an area here that I can put PCBs in. It's sort of spring-loaded to allow me to be able to solder them at a better angle than just doing it on the ground. It has several trays for me to be able to put little components, and then what I really like is right here, it has a little container, a little holder for the solder itself. The other Panavice thing that I use all the time is this standard device here. Uh, it just has a million uses for holding on to things, holding on to wires while I strip them, or holding on to uh, components that I'm soldering stuff to, so a optional but very useful purchase. These things are not optional. You need a multimeter of some sort. There are a lot of them. The one that I have is from Triplet. I've had the same one for probably 15 years now, and it works beautifully. You absolutely need one to be able to check resistances and to be able to check continuity and look for shorts and things like that. It's just a thing you gotta have to be able to start. Then as far as tools go, the most important tools and the ones that I use most often are a pair. There's a small pair of needle nose pliers and a small pair of diagonal cutters. Those you just have to have. You have to use them to be able to clip leads and to be able to put components through PCBs and all sorts of other stuff. So without these also you can't get even get started. For stripping wires, I have a simple wire stripper. You put the wire into the to the right gauge for the size of the wire, you close it, you pull it, and it strips off the plastic sheathing so that you can then use the wire itself. The next thing you need is some way to be able to fix it if you need to remove a component from a PCB. Uh, this will happen. Mistakes are inevitable. So here are a couple of different options. The ones that I use the most often are just these little plunger style things. You take it, you spring load it, you put it over the PCB that you want to remove, you use the soldering iron to be able to warm it up, and then you push it like that and it sucks the solder out. You do that a few times and it'll pull it out. This one here is really big. This is sort of the de facto standard. It's the Salda Pult that's been around for a really long time, for decades and decades. Then the other way to do it is to be able to use solder braids. So this is a type of material that you put over the solder that you're trying to suck up and then you apply the soldering iron to the braid and it pulls the solder into it uh, the same way. I use the vacuum solder 99% of the time. Then there are a couple of other things that are really, really useful, but not quite necessary, certainly when you're getting started. This is a tip tinner, which I use when I'm beginning a day of soldering to be able to clean up the tip of the soldering iron. If it's clean, it'll do a little better job of transferring heat. This is something that I use infrequently, but it's nice to have. It's a little folding device that allows you to be able to set the uh, width of a particular component based on what it is that it needs to be in terms of going into the PCB. Nine times out of ten I just bend it and put it in, don't use it, but it's nice to have it. Then, uh, in order to be able to do certain kinds of soldering, particularly for surface mount soldering, you need an ability to be able to apply some flux to the PCB itself, because that helps flow the solder and allow it to be able to stick a little bit easier. For that I just use this rosin flux pen from MG Chemicals. And finally, if you need to remove an IC or an integrated circuit from the socket that it's in, it's useful to be able to have a pair of, of tweezers like this that are designed for that. You can also use a very small screwdriver, but I like this a little bit better. Another thing that I use frequently is a set of small screwdrivers like this. Very useful not only for DIY PCB stuff, but for you know anything else you need. The next thing that is really important is an oscilloscope. There are two types of oscilloscopes. There are analog oscilloscopes and digital oscilloscopes. This is an old analog oscilloscope. I bought it for all of $100 on Craigslist many years ago, and it works beautifully. I also have this digital oscilloscope from Rigol, this DS1054, which I think is the de facto standard. 
it's very fancy and does a hundred things more than I need it to do, uh, but it's nice to have it. Now there's one last thing that you really need before you're getting started, and that is a clean work surface and good light. So above my work surface, I actually have a pair of lamps shining down to be able to give me a lot of light. And since I'm not young anymore, I have a magnifier that I wear very often while I'm soldering. For a while I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to solder anymore, but this thing makes it possible and it allows me to be able to solder really well. Now when you're doing DIY electronics, there are different ways you can get started. You can just buy a PCB or printed circuit board. You can buy a PCB and a panel, which would be the, the metal panel that you would see in the front. And then you could buy an entire kit like this. Each of these different approaches have their own advantages and disadvantages. If you're buying something that's either a PCB or a PCB panel, then you have to source all of the components yourself. I have a lot of components that I've collected over the years to be able to get that kind of thing started. I have all basic resistors, capacitors, and then a lot of integrated circuits and things like that, switches, pots, and knobs, all of which is great. But every time you end up having to do one or more mail order runs to be able to get components from some of the vendors like Mouser or DigiKey or Tata Electronics. Uh, and in the era of the pandemic, a lot of things are difficult to be able to get. So I'll be sitting there in the position of having a, a setup that's almost completely done, but I'm waiting to try to source three or four difficult to find parts. And so what I do whenever possible is actually buy a kit. And in this case, we're going to be building this Craigley Electronics Euclidean sequencer for For You, which is my standard. I've done a lot of Eurorack, but uh, I tend to do For You Electronics these days instead, which is a little bit bigger. And you can see somebody else went and did all of the work of sourcing all of the materials. So here is the panel. Here are some printed circuit boards, and here are all of the different components, even in neat little packages, which is a ton of work. Um, and so it's worth the extra money to be able to have all of that stuff done for you. This is a luxury, but certainly when you are starting out, at least, I think the idea of buying a kit like this will keep you more focused and motivated and less overwhelmed than trying to be able to find all the stuff online, have it show up, have some of it be wrong, and so forth. So this is the kit that we are going to be building today. Okay, so one of the most important things in terms of getting good, clean solder joints is having a clean tip to your soldering iron. So since I have a spare and we're starting a new project, I think I'm going to take the opportunity to replace the tip. Now the first thing is I made absolutely sure that this is off and has been cold for a while so that there's no heat. Very, very important. Next I unscrew the sheath, pull out the old one, I'll replace it with a new tip, and I like this kind that has sort of a, a, a spade shape at the end. Okay, that's screwed back in, it's tight, and we're ready to start. Okay, another important question is what temperature to set your soldering iron at? Uh, and this is dependent upon the type of solder you use and the PCB itself. Uh, there's never a perfect answer, but what I do is work at 350 degrees centigrade. And the reason is because I am using this lead-free solder, this mutter lead-free solder. So the nice thing about these types of soldering irons as I can turn them on and if you can see down there it says 350 which is our ideal temperature it's heating up to that temperature and will let me know when I'm ready to solder once you start soldering it brings down the temperature of the iron just a little bit and then it pops right back up again also this has got a safety mechanism so if I'm not soldering for a little while it'll automatically bring down the temperature and then I just have to hit a button for it to bring it back up again. And there it is, ready to go. And finally there is one last bit of pre-production that I do before starting one of these, and that is to print out whatever the documentation is that I need. 
Uh, this isn't something that works as well on a, on a computer, you just really need it on a piece of paper. So here is a listing of all of the materials, the bill of materials, which is going to be really important in terms of crossing things off as you put them on the PCB. Here is a schematic so you can get a better overall idea about how things connect together. This is more important for debugging later. And then here is a document with a few build notes of different things to, you want to know about specifically for whatever this kit is. So if this is available, you want to print this out as well. Okay, we're ready to begin. Now, with the PCBs, typically there is silk screening on one side, this white writing, and that is the side that you put the components on. So sometimes you will see stuff on the back side of the PCB as well, such as those, and that indicates that you put the components on that side there. So in this case, all of the resistors and chips and things are going to be on this side of it, but then these 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 connectors here are going to be on the back side to allow it to connect up to a different PCB. Now the next question is what order do you put the components on? And the conventional wisdom is that you put them on from the flattest or the lowest components on the PCB up to the tallest. And that's the way that I do it. So I always do things in the same order. I start with resistors and diodes that are very small and flat uh, and then I work my way up. Usually the sockets for integrated circuits followed by capacitors and then followed by whatever bigger devices there are that go on after that. And so I've pulled out all the resistors and diodes from the kit and set everything else aside. Uh, this is a real luxury to do it this way. It's, it's not necessary. You can absolutely do this just using bags of resistors and components that you have. But it is nice, as I said, when you buy a kit and have everything so neatly laid out the way that they do at SynthCube. Okay, so I have uh, the first PCB in my little holder here, and we're going to start with the resistors on this PCB. Now, there are a total of five on here. I don't know if you can see that on the video, but there are four of them that say 10K, and one of them that says 28K. So that stands for the value of the resistors. In this case, 10 kilo ohms and 28 kilo ohms. So we could just go and take the bag of the 10K resistors and put them in, but I prefer to test one first, just to make sure there wasn't any kind of a mistake. So that's what we're going to do. I'll show you how to do that. Okay, this is one of the reasons why we have this, this multimeter, this super useful device. So currently I have it set in the resistance area, the area where it's going to measure the resistance of a resistor, and I have the dial set to 20K, and the reason is because that's the next value up on there from 10K so that it'll be able to measure it fairly reliably. You, it, you can't measure it with a setting that's lower than the resistance of a given resistor, only with one that is higher than that resistor. So it has these two leads coming out of it, and I've attached those two leads to alligator clips to make it easier for me to just clip on to a component and see. So I'm going to attach the alligator clip leads across that resistor and then when we come up here, it says 9.95 kilo ohms. You may not be able to see it, but that says K ohms. So in other words, uh, this, is, this is 10K, or certainly close enough uh, within analog electronics. It's never going to, or very, very rarely will you ever get a reading that is exactly what it's specified at. It's just supposed to be close. OK, it's time to start putting in some components. So I'm going to take four of those 10 kilo ohm resistors pull them off, then they come on these, these little paper things, just pull those off. And then I'm just going to bend the leads, just like that. Poke it through the hole. Then I'm going to, can't show you this right now, but I'm flaring the leads out in the back a little bit. I'll show you that when I, uh, when I flip the PCB over to solder it. So And then here is the 28 kilo ohm resistor that also goes on this board.
And sometimes if it's a little stuck, we end up using a pair of needle nose pliers to get it through because we want it flat on the board. We don't want anything sticking up. Okay. All right, so now that that's done, now we can turn it around, or in the case of this thing, we can just flip it over like that, and then turn it around. And there we have the resistors all ready to be soldered up. So the first thing I'm going to do is wet the tip of the soldering iron with some solder. We want to make sure that it's got solder all over it smoothly. And then I'm going to run that through the sponge to clean off most of the excess. And then, and this is the part that's going to just take work. The, the point of this whole thing is I'm going to take the spade of the soldering iron, I'm going to put it on the point between the leg of the resistor and the, the through hole so that the metal is touching both. The goal is not for the soldering iron to touch the solder, it's for it to touch the stuff that you are soldering. And so then I slowly come in with the solder. You want to make sure that it makes a smooth circle, that it covers the entire hole properly, uh, and then it just sort of sucks in. There we go. Okay, and then I'll do the one next to it. Yeah, that one, that one came right in and worked just right. Okay, great. So then what you do, and normally I would do all of these, but just to show you, then what you do is you go in with the diagonal cutters and you cut it close to the bottom. And I'm going to do this one as well. Okay. Now, the resolution of this camera isn't good enough uh, to really show it, but this soldering point that I did down there is just right. It is a cone of solder that goes up, uh, almost looks like a little volcano or something like that. It covers the entire, the entire metallic hole that the, the thing goes through. It covers the lead itself. So the lead is now mechanically and electrically connected to the PCB well. So we then just go through and work slowly because this is supposed to be fun and methodically until we solder all the leads. And everyone who does it has their own way of doing it that they've evolved over time. My method works great for me. I don't have any cold solder joints or typically any problems like that. Once I get a board finished and debugged, it works. And it's not usually something I have to go back to. Okay. All right, beautiful. So now I go through, and just like I did with the other one, just clip the leads down by the tip of where the soldering ended. And I see that this last one doesn't have solder all the way around it, so I'm going to redo that one piece of work. Fix any mistakes as you're going along. It's so much easier to do it than to try to debug later. Okay, so, so as you can see, they're all on there. Oops, one mistake. That one right there is poking up. The rest of them are flat. So I'm going to go back in, unsolder that, and fix it. But as you can see, the rest of them are all clean, ready to go, nothing, no solder is touching any other places, there are no solder bridges, 
every, the hole itself is completely covered and they're nice neat little round bumps. So the uh, <laughs> repetitive side of DIY is repeating that, you know, 500 times, but that's the deal. Okay, this is why it's so important to have the bill of materials as a piece of paper printed out while you're working. So I just finished putting in all of the 10K resistors. There are four of them on this PCB and five of them on that one. And so I go up to where I have 10K listed on the thing. I had already put in the first four and then one, two, three, four, five. I've now put in all nine and so I can cross that one out and keep going. This is a perfect way to be able to make sure that all of the components get put in and you're not missing any of them. Okay, I wanted to show the use of this lead bending tool as an alternative way to get your components uh, to fit nicely on your PCB. So here are a couple of 220 ohm resistors. And by the way, resistors that are below a thousand the convention is to use the letter R. So if you see something that says 220R or 330R, that means 220 ohms. So I just take the, the component and I put it across like that and then I just bend the sides down just like that and we get a nice neat thing. The problem is that in this PCB and in many PCBs um, the leads are actually closer together than what the lead bending tool can do. But it's still useful because you can put it in both sides, put it all the way down on one side, and then use a pair of needle nose pliers on the other side to click it into place. And as soon as you do that, you can see that it's nice and uniform and neat and ready to be soldered. Okay, we've now completed all of the resistors for the build. Uh, as you can see, they're all flat and neat on the top. And on the back, there are no solder bridges. All of the little uh, solder blobs are clean. And the leads have been cut off near the top of the blobs, so we don't have to worry about anything potentially shorting out into anything else. So the next thing that we are going to do is look at the diodes. So diodes only allow uh, electricity to flow in one direction. And you can see that there are two diodes on this board. You can see the way that they look. They have a line on one side. So it looks like a little, it, it looks a little bit like a resistor, but it has a line on one side. And that's because diodes are polarized and you have to put them in in the right orientation or else they won't work. So we can see this says D1 and that says D2 and those are the two diodes and in both cases we need to point the, the, the line side of the diode up. This is what the diodes look like. These are very, very standard uh, 1N4148 diodes. There are a lot of different kinds. If we look here, you can see, hopefully, that there's a black line on one side of the diode. And that black line is the line that corresponds to the line on the PCB itself. So other than that one caveat, we put them in exactly the way that we put in resistors. The diodes are in place. And if we take a look on the back, they have slightly bigger pads, which allows you to better see sort of the, the curved volcano nature of the way that the uh, of the way that the solder should look coming up onto the lead itself. Okay, the last thing that looks like a resistor or is in that type of package that we need to put on this uh, PCB are these ferrite beads. There are three of these ferrite beads. They look sort of like resistors. They're these cylinders, but they're really just cylinders of metal um, that act as inductors. And the reason for a ferrite bead is you put them near the power supply with the idea being that they lower some of the high frequency sounds that could interfere with the function of some of the more sensitive computery IC circuits on the board. So this is where having a schematic is kind of neat because we can take a look here and see that that is the 5 volt voltage regulator. So the section down here is the power supply. There is a ferrite bead. There is a ferrite bead. And there is a ferrite bead. And so 
they're used to be able to eliminate some of the high frequency junk that could get into the way of the proper functioning of some of the computer IC circuits. And so we put them on the board. They look just like uh, resistors and other things. And then they have leads that go through the back that we'll solder up just like we did with the resistors and with the diodes. The next thing that we are going to do is not the capacitors or the ICs or the hardware. The next thing that we're going to do is put in these sockets that the ICs go into. So here's the way that it works. These integrated circuits um, have a, a particular number of pins, usually on two sides, so they might have 8 or they might have 14 or they might have 24 pins. And so you need sockets that match the same number of pins as the integrated circuits themselves. And we do this so that if an IC burns out or we need to replace it or we need to test it or whatever, rather than having to unsolder the, all of those uh, points from the PCB, we just pry it out of this little socket instead. So it's very well worth it. Um, one thing that's very important is that the sockets themselves have a little cutout. They have a little C on one side. And as you look here on the, on the silk screen, you can see that C as well. So it's very important that you align the socket with the same orientation with the same orientation as the way that it looks on the silk screen. And that is because, of course, you can only put the IC in in one direction. If you put it in the other way, it won't work and you might even blow it up. So very important as you're putting these sockets in that you match that up. Now, the reason that I like to put in the sockets at this point is because the boards are still really flat. And so if we take a socket and we put it in, I can turn it over and solder it without worrying about other big things that are bumping it and keeping it from being able to lay flat. So the first thing that you do is you put it in with the proper orientation. Then you turn it over and you put it down on a flat surface so that all of the holes, all of the pins are sticking through. And then what you do is you don't pin all of them down. You push down with a little bit of pressure and all you're doing is a, a pair of diagonals. So I'm going to do this pin here and this pin here. And the reason that I do that is because that way I can turn it over and see whether it is flush with the surface. And as you can see here, if you look carefully, it isn't flush. So therefore I need to go and re-solder that one up there to push down and make sure that the IC is all the way flush with the surface. So, very simple. Just need to heat up that pin and give it a little bit of downward pressure. There it goes. Clicked right in. And now, good, I'm really glad that happened. So now, you can see that it's flush all the way around and the socket is properly placed on the PCB. So at this point you can either solder all of those together, uh, which sometimes I do, but you can also just put the rest of the sockets onto the board in exactly the same way. Just put in, put them in, tack them down diagonally to make sure that they are flush with the board, which they are, and then move on to the next one. Okay, so now I've put all of the ICs on both this board and that one there. And so now comes the tedious task of going in and soldering down all of the pins. And all you do is just go along pin by pin and slowly solder them down. Take your time and look for solder bridges as you go because these pins are very closely spaced together and you don't want one to accidentally blob into another one. So just be patient, take your time and enjoy the ride. And there's one IC socket all soldered in. Okay, the next thing that I am going to uh, attach are the pins for the Arduino Nano that runs this particular module. Now, 
something like this is expensive and it can be somewhat fragile. I don't want to mess it up. And so whenever you have something like that, um, I'm going to go through and test fit the pieces to be able to make sure I did everything the right way. So there's not a lot of documentation, so it could have gone this way or could have gone that way. And the Arduino itself could have gone this way or that way. Although since there's a reset button on top, it makes sense that it goes this way. And then there are these six pins there and these six pins here, which as it turned out, they don't line up. Uh, so I don't know if this was a bug from, you know, another iteration of this board or whatever it might be, but after doing research online, it turns out that these pins are not necessary because they're duplicated on these pins here. So what I figured out was that the right way to connect this thing up is like this with the pins going long ways in through the top and then the Arduino goes on there just like that. So I am not going to actually solder up the Arduino yet. I'm going to do that last and the reason is because uh, I want to clean up this board and get all of the flux and residue off this board before we put anything like that in. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but I am going to solder up these pins and then because those stick up quite a bit, I'm going to go through with the diagonal cutters and, uh, and cut them down. So just like with the IC sockets, I soldered the, uh, the first and the last pins on both sides to make absolutely sure that these things are sitting flat, which they are. So now I will go through and solder these and then get in there with the diagonal cutters and clip those so that they're tight to the board. You can see how much easier it is to solder all of those things up when it's uh, in a nice pan of ice like this. Um, all of these pins are so close together you really have to look very carefully to make sure you don't have any solder blobs. Uh, and one other thing that I wanted to show, another technique which is great, um, in terms of these little pieces of flying metal, I just sort of clipped them uh, before, but the way that I really like to do it is I clip it with my finger on top, which means that it doesn't go flying, it just stays right on the board as I clip it, and then I can just throw them in the trash. So, much cleaner and neater. This is also very useful for clipping the leads off of resistors and other components like that. Okay, now it's time to put the capacitors in, uh, and there's a couple of things to note uh, about this. So, we have five different types and values of capacitors. Of those, most of them are mylar or film or ceramic, and so therefore they don't have a polarity. However, there are four of them here that are electrolytic capacitors, and those have to be put in, uh, in the proper orientation or they'll blow up. So we will do those last. Let's take a look at these. Um, the majority of the uh, things that we're putting in are these 100 nanofarad ceramic caps, which are known as bypass capacitors, or they're used very frequently as bypass capacitors, which just means that they have a little bit of, a little bit of power uh, right, near the, right near the IC. So in case it needs it to be able to maintain uh, a steady supply of power, you've got a little bit there that you can use. And in fact, it doesn't even say the value of them, it says BP for bypass capacitor. Now, the reason that that's important in this case is because these are 100 nanofarads, but then there are another pair of 100 nanofarad capacitors. So these are capacitors that are the same value, but they have a different purpose, and in fact they are different. They're film instead of ceramic, and the way that they delineate that here on this particular board is right there and there 
it says 100 N and the, the diagram is a little bit different than the diagram for the bypass capacitors. So why is that important? Well, it's important to know enough about this stuff to try to understand why it is that those kinds of things happen. And so when there's a little bit of shorthand that's used like that, um, you know what to do about it. So with that in mind, I'm going to go through and start by working on putting in all of the bypass capacitors. There's 10 of them. I'm going to clip them uh, right about there with the clippers uh, because I don't need these big long leads and it'll make it a little bit faster for me to be able to take them out uh, and put them in. Okay, the bypass capacitors have been added. They're all of these little orange things. You can see that they're very uh, tight and close to the, to the PCB. They're neat and uniform. And on the back, even though things are getting a little bit full and a little bit complicated, uh, everything is clean. Next I'll put in these five little uh, 22 picofarad capacitors. Uh, they're very small, they don't hold a lot of charge. And you can see on the, on the board it just says 22p. That's where they go. Okay, now we're going to put in these blocky film capacitors. We have this one here that's 330 nanofarads, and these two that are 100 nanofarads. These film capacitors are not polarized, so it doesn't matter what the orientation is as you put them in. Okay, these are the last of the capacitors that we are going to put in, and as I mentioned, these are the uh, electrolytic capacitors. Now, electrolytic capacitors are polarized, so you can only put them in in one orientation. There's a couple of ways to be able to tell how the uh, what the orientation of the capacitor is. So if we take a look at this one, oh, and by the way, there are sort of two flavors, two shapes of electrolytic capacitors. There are radial capacitors like this, where both legs come out of one side, and then there are axial capacitors, which look you know more like a, a big resistor or something where you have the leads coming out of both sides of the capacitor, but they both do the same thing. So if we take a look at this, there's a couple of ways we can tell what the orientation is. One side has got a minus symbol on it, so therefore obviously the other side is the plus side, and then the other way you can always tell is that the lead for the plus side is always a bit longer than the lead for the minus side. So this is one of those things where you want to double and triple check to make sure that everything is right, because if not, you put it in backwards and you power it up, they can actually pop and potentially damage uh, other components as well. So if we take a look here on the if we take a look here on the PCB, those are the spots right here where the capacitors are going to go in, and you can see a little teeny tiny, teeny tiny plus sign on one side, and that means that the positive side of the capacitor goes in there, and the negative side thus goes in the other one. So. If we were to take this one, we know that the long lead goes into the plus side. There. The shorter lead goes into the minus side. And then you put it in and solder it up just like the rest of the components. And there it is with the uh, radial capacitor uh, put into the PCB the way that it should be. As you can see, it is flush to the bottom. Okay, now we're going to put in a couple of additional components that you see on some circuits, but not on all of them. Uh, the first one is a voltage regulator. So that is this little device right here. It has three of these legs, and it has a circle right there that you attach a heat sink to um, so that it doesn't get too hot. The purpose of a voltage regulator is to take an input voltage and then turn it into whatever the voltage is that you need for um, the circuits. In this case, we're taking in 12 volts and we're turning it into 5 volts to be able to run uh, the, the computer-based circuitry. So you can see here there is a, a line on the bottom of this, a bold line right there, and that corresponds to the rear of the voltage regulator, to this section here. So. Just put it in, just like anything else, and that is the proper orientation for the voltage regulator. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is put on the power cable connector, and this is yet another place to, to get things wrong. So we need to make sure that the orientation of the connector works with our power supply so that we don't inadvertently 
put minus 12 into 12 and 12 into minus 12. So if we take a look over here, we can see the orientation on the PCB. Now let's go over and look at the rack that this thing is going into. Okay, this is a pretty foolproof method of making sure that we get this right. So if you look down here, um, this is the, the power system that distributes power to the modules. In this case, the blue line um, is plus 12 and the red line is minus 12. So we take a look here on this and there's only one way that the piece will fit into that. So there it is with the unit itself um, attached to where it's going to go. And so I'm going to just take the pen and make a little plus symbol on the side that we know is for plus 12. Then when we take it back to the module, we'll know that we'll put it in correctly. So now I can take this and put it right where it belongs. And the plus side is oriented to the plus 12 volt input, so we know that we're not going to have any nasty surprises when we plug this thing in. Okay, as we get close to finishing up this PCB, there are a bunch of decisions that we can make that are not earth shattering, but that are, uh, you know, determine the order of things that we need to do. So in this case, there is one more set of wires or one more set of things that we need to solder through that will end up being soldered on this side. And that is a pair of these three wire connections there that are going to connect to this MIDI port. And so I'm going to do those right now before I solder anything on this side. And the reason is because that way we can clean off all of the flux on this side of the PCB uh, easily without having anything else getting in our way. So I'm going to solder those on and then we're going to move on to uh, something else that's pretty important here. So I need to prepare three uh, little short wire leads for this. Now for this I'm going to be using solid core wire, which I almost never do. I almost always use stranded wire, but for something like this with data um, and because it's not a big deal, I am going to just use this solid core wire. It'll be fine. So I open up my strippers. I go in there maybe, oh, I don't know, whatever that is, a quarter inch, and just pull it through, and that's it. I'm not going to do the other end yet because I might end up clipping it shorter when I actually get it in place relative to the MIDI connection. So now those are all done, and then I'm just going to put them in from this side, just like that and then solder them from the back just like it would any other component. So the next step in this process is cleaning the flux off of the PCB board after you've soldered it. So what is flux? Well, flux is a resin that is actually embedded within the solder and it is used to help the solder flow so that it will adhere to the, you know, the leads of the components and the pads and everything that are there. So imagine this sticky resin that you really need to be able to make it work. The problem is, once you're done, that resin is still there and it's this sticky gooey glue that uh, you know, will stay forever unless you clean it off. So there are a couple of reasons why you want to do that. The first one is having that flux on the board over a long period of time could potentially uh, cause problems and corrosion and things like that. And the other reason is because with extremely sensitive electrical areas of the board, the flux can actually alter the electrical functioning of the PCB itself. So for both of those reasons uh, and for the longevity of the circuit, we really want to get the flux off. Before I found the way that I use now, I was using this stuff, this flux remover spray. You put it on and you spray it and you use a, 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 a toothbrush and then uh, you can rub it off and the flux goes away. And I found a safer way to do it and a much better way to do it, which is the way that I do it now. Okay, so I have a little plastic bowl, I've got my PCB, and I put it on a paper towel just to, to help clean up a little bit. And what I'm using is straight up isopropyl alcohol. So this is the same thing as rubbing alcohol, except that it's 99% pure um, instead of 70% pure. So uh, isopropyl alcohol, just pouring a little bit into a bowl. This bottle lasts forever. Using a toothbrush, getting the toothbrush really soaked with the alcohol. And then all I'm going to do is scrub the alcohol into the PCB, okay, just like you brushing your teeth. That's the first part. 
So once I have that alcohol on there, then I'm going to use these Kimtech tech wipes. These are scientific um, tissues, really. And the reason that they're used for science stuff is because they don't have lint, right? So it's almost like tissue paper or toilet paper, except it doesn't have lint. Uh, and what you do with these, and this is something I learned on the net, is you just sit here and you rub the Kimtex over the back of the PCB, and you do it fairly vigorously. And what'll happen is that it'll shred the it'll shred the Kimtex just as if you were, you know, grating cheese on a cheese grater because of the sharpness of all of those little points. So the flux comes off with the Kimtex, and it just comes off of the PCB board. So let's uh, let's give it one more pass. Just to put some isopropyl alcohol on there. Take a Kimtech and just let it get shredded by the back of the PCB. And the flux comes off with the shredded Kimtech and with the alcohol. So super easy, convenient way to do it. Then when you're done. Just brush off, brush off the Kimtech. And if you look again, I don't know how closely you can look within the close-up, you know, within the limitations of this camera, but the flux is all gone. It's it's completely clean. All we have is the PCB board and the solder. Now the next step is going to be to attach our two PCBs together. So uh, particularly with things like this, with Eurorack modules and with all of these modules, um, the PCBs may have too much stuff on them to be able to fit neatly within the given allotted space that you have. Um, so you can't really put everything on the single PCB, and so therefore we have a couple of PCBs. This one is the one that's going to connect to the faceplate, and then it needs to connect with this one, uh, which is going to handle uh, most of the processing and so forth. So if you think about it, we're going to have three layers here. We'll have the come here. We're going to have the faceplate, followed by that board, followed by that board. Okay. Now the faceplate is going to connect to this board through the various pots that are going to be wired directly from one to the other. So that'll be pretty straightforward. But what's less straightforward is how to be able to get these sandwiched together. And the way that we do it is by using these. These are these, these stackable headers. So we have these male headers here, and then we have these female header receptacles there. And as you can see, one goes directly into the other push down and you get a really good uh, solid connection just with a pressure fit. So the way that you do it is that you can see here on the back of our board um, are these white outlines where we're going to place these, these female PCB headers. We're going to solder those in, then we're going to take the male ones and we're going to attach them to the female ones on this side, then pressure fit this into place and then solder the pieces in place on the male side. So I'm going to start by cutting the female sides. Now you always need more uh, than you think. There's wastage and it's just an inherently messy thing in which I've screwed things up a lot. So definitely get more uh, of, the, of the headers than you think that you're going to need. Don't just get exactly the right number for the number of holes that you have. So we'll start with this one here and I'll count it. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So there's twelve holes. We need twelve pins. So I'm gonna just use this little thing to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And then I'll stick that there just to sort of hold my place. Um, and then I go in and I'm going to use my straight cutters to cut the next. Still on there, there we go. I'm gonna use my straight cutters to cut the next square over. 
Okay, and it looks like it worked. Okay, so now that we've soldered the, the female sides in place, it's time to do the male sides. And there's a technique to doing that as well. We're going to clip male pieces that are the right length to fit into each of the female sockets. So the first one is three. And the males are much easier to do, actually, than the female ones. So then we take the male ones and stick them all the way in to the female sockets. The male pieces have now all been fitted into the female pieces. And the reason is so that if we have any problems with things being slightly out of alignment, uh, they'll be out of alignment on both sides and then the whole thing will just fit together. It's like a custom fit. So once we have the male ones inserted into the female, we go along and fit them ah, just like that. And then one more over here. Fit them in. Boom. Until they're all connected on both sides. So now we can solder the male ends and then everything will be all synced up so we can take the, take the cards apart and then put them back together again easily. And with that job done, we now have a, a set of cards that we can carefully take apart to work on and then put back together again for the final assembly. Now it's finally time to go take a look at the front panel and start working on some of the user interface elements. So the first thing we're going to look at here um, is this little LED panel. There's an LED that's going to go right there within the window of it. And this is why it's always a good idea to print out the general build notes. There's a section here saying that there's a pin number uh, here on the matrix that needs to be oriented correctly with the same pin number on the board. So we take a look here and it says pin 1 goes right there. And if you look on there, there's, there's one that mentions pin 1. Orient it like that before soldering. And obviously this thing is expensive and it would be difficult to uh, replace it. So it's a perfect example of measure twice, cut once. I'm going to make absolutely sure that the, uh, the orientation of this thing is proper before I seat it and then, and then solder it in place. Okay, the next thing that we need to do is put this piece of plexiglass over this window where the LEDs are going to be. So we have to do it from the back. And I already measured it out in terms of just putting those uh, little corners there. And I'm going to try using contact cement to be able to cement it into place. And hopefully that'll do it. If not, then once, it's, once that's uh, glued up, then I can use some hot glue to, to try to give it even more. But I'm just going to use a straight up brush. And now I need to put some onto the onto the plexiglass itself, the same thing, because you need this on both surfaces. All right. I'm going to let that sit for 15 minutes and then uh, come back and put it into place. Okay, it's been 15 minutes. Time to carefully position and press down the piece. All right, I'm going to put something heavy on that and let it sit. Okay, now comes one of the real fun parts of the project where we uh, really start to see it take shape, and that's when we start putting uh, the, the various elements into the front panel. So when you're working in for you like this, um, the way that you do it is that you put the banana jacks, which are used for audio and control voltages, you put them into the front panel, um, you put switches into the front panel, and in this case we also have this specialty uh, MIDI jack that we're going to be putting into the front panel. What you don't put into the front panel are 
potentiometers, um, the little movable pots that you use to be able to adjust parameters. These end up getting uh, soldered into the PCB itself. Um, and then you put the whole thing together and then, and then bolt that into place. But we're going to start by uh, putting all of the pieces in to the front panel and see it start to take shape. Okay, I'm going to start by putting in the banana jacks, and these are some of my favorites because they are just so easy to do. So, if we look here, we have four blue ones in a row. That corresponds to these, so I'll just take a blue banana jack, fit it right through, and it goes. And then you just take a nut. You don't even need a washer. Get it on there, and then I always just use a uh, socket without the socket wrench itself to be able to get it into place. It's plenty, it's plenty strong enough. You don't want to go too hard because it's plastic, uh, but you want to just get a nice tight by hand thing. Okay, I'm going to screw the last two elements into the front panel. The first one is the MIDI jack. Just fits in. On it goes. And then the switch, so it has a nut on the bottom that you can use to adjust the height of the column. And then it has this little washer here that, that sits on the bottom of it. And then once it goes through the panel, then there is another washer and a nut for the top. Here it is, it just goes through the hole from the rear. And then a washer and a nut. And then again, I'm going to use, um, again, I'm just going to use a socket, just sort of holding it and twisting it with my hand to hold it in place. For this one, we want to make sure that it is roughly vertical, because that's how the picture shows it. And then from there, we'll end up soldering wires from th through these three points to the points on the PCB where it connects up. Okay, the last things that we have to add are these uh, little encoders. As I said, these kinds of things you attach to the circuit board first and then they poke through. These are going to be used digitally. These are not just regular uh, resistor pots, so they are all the same value. We don't have to worry about it. If this was a purely analog circuit, um, sometimes the values of these of potentiometers that look like this are, are different from each other and you have to make absolutely sure that you put the right one in the right place. But in this case they're all the same. So the plan is to take them, they fit very neatly just one way on the board. I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to solder just one leg, just one pin, maybe that one, to get it in place. Do all three of them and the reason is so that I can then fit them to the panel to make sure that they uh, go through and everything is adjusted properly before I finish the soldering. So I'll get all of them working, put them through the panel, then with the panel on there I'll turn it over and solder the rest of the points. All three of them have now been soldered on at just a single point so we can move them if necessary and so now we can take the panel and put it on and fit it so everything fits in well and so I'm going to leave the panel on while I solder the rest of the points, and that'll tack it into place. At this point, we can uh, test fit all the pieces together and get a really good idea um, about how it's going to look and how it's going to feel, which is terrific. Um, still quite a ways to go. We have to insert all of the ICs into the sockets. We have to solder down the Arduino Nano and then flash it uh, with the firmware. And then there are wires that we have to connect, and you have to connect the banana jacks, and all of that kind of thing, so... Okay, we are really in the home stretch. Um, it's time to solder in the uh, Arduino Nano and put all of the ICs uh, into their proper sockets. Now, for this part, I am wearing a grounding strap on my wrist, and this connects directly into uh, you know, you just plug it into a regular household plug, but it's only, you know, it's only the ground pin. And the reason is to be able to make sure that your body is grounded to the system so that there's less chance that any static electricity um, from your body could damage one of the sensitive uh, 
the one of the sensitive chips. It's just a precaution. I've never actually broken anything, but um, I always think it's a good idea when we get to this phase. So we've already test fit the Arduino Nano. And so now we put it in, and then just like all of the other ones, I will be soldering one corner there and one corner there, making sure that those are perfect and, and that everything is seated really well before I do the rest of it. Now, these uh, pins are very, very close together, of course, and so this is going to involve a, a lot of delicacy and finesse, and it's something in which I'll absolutely take my time with the soldering, not use a lot of solder itself, and look very, very carefully for any kind of solder bridges that could uh, that could tank the functioning of the Arduino. Uh, I've got the, the soldering iron set at 350 degrees Celsius. I would like to have it a little hotter than that, but I'm not going to. Uh, because of the delicacy of, you know, the, the type of computer trips that we're doing here, so. There we go. We want to keep these uh, pins hot as for as short a time as we possibly can. There's just this moment where you see the solder get sucked into the pin or into the into the hole and you know that you've got it. There we go. And then you just keep going. If I push a little bit more pressure against the pin itself, um, I get a little bit more surface area of the soldering iron on it. And that allows me to hold it there for a shorter period of time. All right, those all look pretty clean. I'm going to turn it around so that I am soldering from the outside rather than the inside, so I don't have to worry about the soldering iron touching any of those components that are there. Okay, there we are. All soldered up. I'll look it over very carefully to make sure there are no solder bridges, but I don't see any. I think that we're good. Okay, it's time to put the uh, ICs in. There are one, two, three, four, five uh, ICs that we need to put onto this board. The last thing I did before getting ready for this was to clean up any last parts of the PCB board that have a little bit of flux on them uh, before moving on to this part. Um, ICs are very fragile. As I had mentioned before, they are polarized. So if we take a look at this one, you can see that there's a dot on one end, but on the other end there's a half circle cut out. And that half circle corresponds with the half circle on the uh, on the circuit boards. This is the TLO 74 op amp. And so we look here and we can see right in there, right inside there it says TLO 74. And you see that half circle there on that side and that shows us the polarity. So, what we do with these things, um, if you take a look very carefully, you can see that the pins themselves actually bow out a little bit. Um, that's the way that they manufacture them. The problem with that is that they don't always fit very easily and neatly into the sockets that way, and if you push down and the pin goes the wrong way, you can bend, you can bend the leg of an IC. Um, so what I do is I take a pair of needle nose pliers and very gently just cant them slightly inward on both sides. Just a touch. and that will help it sit better in the in the socket. So I'm going to put that TLO 74 in now. 
apologies if my hands cover the, the camera. So I make sure that the orientation is correct. And then I'm going to fit one side, the legs of one side in. And then fit the other side in. Check to make sure that nothing is squished. And that all of the pins look like they're going into the proper sockets. And then just place a little bit of gentle downward pressure until it's all the way in. And there it is. So you can see that the pins are uniform on that side and on that side there aren't any bent pins. Here just to show you just how fragile and finicky these legs are, here is the TLO 71 op amp and I don't know what happened I think as I was pulling it out of the bag um, it pulled up and bent one of the legs mm -hmm. so I'm gonna try to put it back into place pretty good. Oh, one other thing, with these small 8-pin uh, with these small 8-pin packages uh, there is a dot that usually points out pin 1 uh, right up there as opposed to the half circle, the half moon that you see in a lot of the other ones. But it means the same thing. That's it. Okay, we are moving towards powering this thing up for the first time, but there's one uh, thing that we need to do first, and that is attach the heat sink to the voltage regulator. So these voltage regulators have a tendency to, to generate a lot of heat, and so you put a heat sink on it to be able to dissipate that. Um, so it's very simple. I'm just putting a screw through the little hole in the voltage regulator holding the heat sink on, putting on a little teeny tiny nut, okay just about there, just Hold the nut with my needle nose. That's it. Heat sink attached. Now it's time to take this thing over to the synthesizer and plug it in. There is one thing that uh, I usually do before powering these up for the first time and I forgot to do it this time. And that is that before I put in the before I put in the ICs, uh, I like to power it up and then check to make sure that we have voltage coming in to power the ICs at the places where we need them to. And I forgot to do it, but uh, we'll do it here. That'll be the first thing we'll do. So we can see here that we should be expecting voltage coming in the TLO71 on pin 7 the TLO74 on pin 4, the LM393 on pin 8, the display driver on pin 19, and the 74HCT04, uh, we should be seeing positive voltage at 14. So it's just a nice quick little debugging thing, and for the uh, Arduino Nano it's handily written right on the unit. That is the voltage in pin right there. It's go time. I'm over here at uh, my Serge synthesizer um, and we are going to power up the card for the first time. Now note it's not connected to the panel The panel yet, we don't need it to be. Right now we're just testing uh, everything that's happening inside on the card to make sure that we think it's working. Then if it does then we'll wire up the panel. Here we go. Oh. 
Ooh, look at that. LEDs immediately lit up on the Arduino. I think that is a good thing. All right, let's quickly go through and check voltages. So I've got my multimeter here. It's set to DC voltage, and I have it set to the 20 volt mark because we're looking for 5 volts on uh, these things. So we need something higher than 5 volts. But Okay, here we go. Um, it sure looks like the Arduino is working, but let's measure um, the voltage anyway. So the black lead touches ground, and the red lead touches the voltage in, and we're getting 4.6 volts. So close enough to 5, I think. Now let's check the TL071 op amp, which is right there. Again, I'll just use the ground from the Arduino, and then hit pin 7. And we've got 12 volts, perfect. So here's the TL074, we're going to do the same thing. We want to see the voltage coming in on pin 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, touch ground, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we've got 12 volts coming into the TL074. I think we're in good shape here. The LM393 is this one right there. And according to our thing, we should be seeing voltage on pin 8 which is the last one. So again, I'll touch the ground on the, on the Nano because it's convenient. There's 12 volts coming into that one. Okay, and now it's time to deal with something uh, that I've always found uh, quite fiddly, whether it's Arduino or Teensy, and that is actually loading the program onto the little computer. So to start with, I have disconnected the, the power coming in from the, the synthesizer because it's getting power from its USB cable. So I have a USB cable for the Arduino Nano plugged into a USB port on a PC of mine that is running Windows 7. So with that in mind, I am now going to download the source code from uh, Craig Lee Sound's website, um, as well as the latest version of the Arduino integrated development environment, and get all the software installed and working on my PC and then we'll go through the process of installing the program onto the Arduino, which we should only have to do once. Here we are at Craig Lee's website, which is clsound.com. We've navigated to the Euclidean Sequencer page, and now I'm going to download the 4U Euclidean Sequencer code right there. Okay, I downloaded the zip file from the website and then extracted it, and here we have Euclidean Sequencer version 1.1. I open that up and there's a couple of things. The first thing in here is this folder that has all of the source code for the Arduino sketch itself. And then we have this folder, which are a couple of libraries that we're going to have to install into our Arduino system. So the next thing we need to do now is go to Arduino and download their integrated development environment. Okay, I'm at arduino.cc and I'm going to download the Windows version of the Arduino IDE. It'll save it as an EXE and then I'll install it. Arduino has been uh, successfully installed on this computer. Now I have to add the custom libraries that came along with it uh, into the Arduino library area so that the source code can find it. Program files, Arduino, libraries. So then over here, here is the source code. You can just open that up and just drag the libraries that we need right into that folder. and the two libraries that we need are both installed. Now we can open up the development environment. Okay, this is why I like analog electronics. As I said, getting, getting the Arduino connected to the computer is a very fiddly thing. This is actually the second computer. I first tried doing it with a Mac with no success. And so I have downloaded Arduino 1.8.19 from the Arduino website, installed it, and then realized I needed to go to the Elegoo website to download the device driver for their particular version of this Arduino Nano, which I did. I installed it, restarted the computer, and it said that it is on COM4. 
So here, finally, we can see I've configured it to an Arduino Nano, COM4, but it wasn't uploading. It wasn't uploading at all, and there was no reason why. It just wouldn't do it, and it said errors. Until I came here and replaced this with AT Mega 328P Old Bootloader. And now uh, I was able to upload the, 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 the default sketch into the Nano. So. so with all that in mind, and knowing that we've already installed the libraries into the right place, we should finally be ready to go. Here we go. We can double click on the Euclidean 4U sequencer.ino file. There it is. It opens up. You can see the rest of the functions in there as well. So let's verify it and make sure that it compiles first. And it appears to have compiled properly with no problems. So now we can upload it to the Arduino by clicking on this little right arrow button. And as soon as you do, it says upload. Here we go. All right. There it is, done uploading. Hopefully it's all working. So we will disconnect it from the computer, plug it back in to the synthesizer power supply, and see if we get anything. Okay, I plugged it into the synth power supply, and I can see uh, LEDs blinking away over there. But here is what's really exciting. Take a look at that. The LED matrix is working, which means that the whole thing is hopefully working. So now it's time to remove this from the power supply and go attach it to the front panel. Okay, now it's time to put the panel pieces together uh, for good. So we'll remove the protective tape. Attach this here. And then the next thing we're going to do is screw the screws onto here and I'll show you how we uh, connect the bananas in. So the bananas actually go through holes in the PCBs that are cut for them and then all we do is take the leg of a resistor or a component and then solder it between that section and there and uh, it makes it really really easy to be able to wire up these banana jacks. Okay here's how this works. So. I just take a uh, resistor leg from a resistor that we used and I just clipped and cut off and I put it into this little hole and then bend it down. So now it's sitting on the board. I'll grab a little solder. A little fiddly to do this with the camera in the way, but there we go. Solder it up, and then all we do, we don't. It's, there are little holes in the bananas, but we don't use them. Instead, you just drape it over the top. And the reason is because if you need to take it apart again, it's a lot faster and easier to just unsolder these from the top of the banana of the banana jack than to uh, do it any other way. Sounds like there is a puppy on guard. And that's it, and now the banana jack is attached. It took all of about five minutes to solder up those banana jacks, and they're really solid. They aren't going uh, anywhere. And I wired the switch pretty much the same way that I did the banana jacks. I just put uh, resistor leads into those holes and then bent them into the little sockets for the switch and soldered them in place. Uh, they're not going to go anywhere. Next up is to attach uh, this piece to that, screw some screws in to be able to hold it in place, and then wire up the MIDI thing, and uh, we're pretty much done. Okay, as we're wrapping up here, um, here's a little nicety. We have uh, a couple of screws with three nuts each, and we are going to use them to hold these pairs of PCBs together. So they're already pressure fitted together you know, with these connections, but if we use screws with nuts, then uh, it would be much harder for them to be able to come apart. So I'm going to run one nut for the top, one nut there, and one nut underneath, because those three will allow us to be able to hold them together and to be able to adjust uh, their width if need be. So that's it for the screws, very simple. One on either side, and it will just keep this thing from being able to come apart at all. 
very last soldering job we have to do on this project is to wire up the MIDI output jack to these three wires that we put there a little while back. If you look down here it shows that the wires go to pins 4, pins 2, and pin 5 respectively. And if we look over here I went up to the MIDI website to make sure I had the right spec and the rear view female jack, which this is, is 1, 4, 2, 5, 3. I've already stripped the wires. All I have to do now is solder them to those pins down there and we'll be done. That's all there is to it. That was the last soldering. Those three wires are connected up to the mini interface. One very last thing to do and that is to put the knobs on. Now in this case these are these D-shaped sockets there and the knobs themselves are D-shaped so there's only one way where they can go. You just slip it on and press it down. Alright, the unit is totally done. Let's plug it in and take it for a test drive. Well, with all of that hard work, let's actually uh, take the boat out of the harbor and take it for a spin here. I think I'll do a uh, separate video that actually goes into the thing in a little bit more detail. But let's just have a listen to it after all of that. You can see from the light show that everything is moving along. Uh, it's a three-channel Euclidean sequencer. So here's the first channel. Nothing interesting. Let's increase the length. And then increase the density. There we go. We can make it really dense. Or dial it back. Now let's bring in another channel. So now to go explore channel 2, I just push down the second button there. Well, that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. I hope you got something out of my process and that you are inspired to take on building an electronic circuit of some kind yourself. As always, if you like what I'm doing here on Under the Big Tree, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. But for now, this is Nick, signing off.